Hey, okay. Hi, Mark. So here we are. Uh, and uh, we've got a lot of discussion about the uh, Jewish Socialist Bund because it's been mentioned in the book uh, that was uh, uh, recently published by Yale University Press of all presses. And it's uh, Daniel Boyarin, who's published a book called The No State Solution. And in his introduction, he says that he's going to deal with uh, all the proofs for the Jewish people as a nation, but not as a state. And he's going to prove it using Talmudic sources, all the way up to and including what he calls the Yiddish Socialist Bund. So we get a mention, you know, in his right in his introduction in this book published by Yale University Press. I find it incredible. I have it, but I haven't read it yet. I have read the uh, smaller article, which is on the uh, Anarchist Library website. Tell us about that one. I've started to read it. It's uh, I I think it's it's pretty similar. There's a uh, note at the end of the article, uh, which says not to confuse it with the book, and uh, but I think my impression is that the ideas are 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 very similar, uh, basically arguing for uh, supporting the rights of of Palestinians, um, and uh, and for the elim elimination of of the concept of the nation state. Um, and, and so it's, it's very good. It's a, it's a, it's a conversation back and forth, but the uh, two conversants seem to agree on, on most things. So it's, 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 it's nicely, it's nicely written. I should say nicely said, since it's a conversation, um, and, uh, well put together. Um, you I should mention that this is a, uh, uh, a, uh, an argument in favor of a one state, a no state yeah. solution. <laughs> from an anarchist point of view That's which is rather convenient for anarchism yeah. so there's an anarchist uh, argument in favor of a no state solution in that book that you mentioned then there's the Talmudic uh, justification for a no state solution as well by Daniel Boyarin and there's the Bundist uh, work on the Federation of Palestinian and Hebrew Nations otherwise known as the one state the no state solution uh, that uh, I've published, you know, on behalf of the Bund. So now we have three works from different perspectives and different methodologies that are coming to prove the same thing, that a no-state solution is necessary, that the nation-state is, is obsolete, and that the Zionist nation-state is reactionary and has turned fascist. Even the Labour Party has turned fascist there. It was obsolete there. a long time ago, and... Set. I mean, I, I think we're. I think we're seeing the evidences of of its uh, of the fact that it's obsolete around the world, and you know, with the the conflicts between Israel and Gaza, between Russia and Ukraine, uh, the the basically the the moral bankruptcy of the concept of national sovereignty that it simply doesn't work anymore. Precisely. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the trouble. That's why the war in Ukraine is is going on and on, you know, because the central authority in Kyiv, you know, wants to proclaim itself as a nation state, only one nation. So they want to take over the eastern part of the Ukraine, which was a population that was uh, mixed Russian-Hungarian. And so they want to, uh, I suppose, do away with the Russians, you know, killing so many Russians that the rest of the Russians... Uh, would leave and you know leave the territory to the central Ukrainian authority. Well, it didn't work because they formed their own militia. Yeah. I even saw one of their barricades, which had a sign in front of it saying "Antifa." And, what I uh, don't like about it is is the fact that really the um, the 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 entire war was was really provoked by NATO, and um, NATO NATO basically went in, and in order to basically take something away from Putin, uh, staged a coup like the U.S. and NATO have frequently done, uh, overthrew the government and uh, put wanted to put somebody new in there. Uh, they did not originally want Zelensky, but somehow he ended up there anyway, and he's worked out for NATO, so they're happy with him, I guess, more or less. But he's a... Um, uh, it's. I don't really. I don't really think there's there's any good or, or evil on, on either side. I think I think they're all evil. 
of it because it's imperialism on both sides, uh, whether it's Western imperial imperialism or Russian imperialism. And uh, but but it was Western imperialism, NATO, that started the whole thing. And if, if NATO had kept their their finger out of the whole mess, this whole thing never would have started. I mean, how would how would the United States like it if if uh, Russia came in and took over Mexico or took mm -hmm. over Canada? Obviously, the U.S. would not put up with it. So why is NATO so surprised or so upset that that Russia is complaining about NATO coming in and taking over Ukraine? And I mean, obviously, Ukraine has Russians in it because in Soviet days, um, Russians basically moved into every place that was a part of the Soviet Union. But originally, Ukraine was not a part of Russia. It was a separate country with a related language, but still a separate country, arguably an older country, an older country than Russia. Um, but it's 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 a shame. There's no reason for this to have happened. If 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 the United States had simply kept their hands off of Ukraine, this whole mess would not be happening right now. But so I, I don't think Ukraine was ever a separate country from uh, Russia before before Lenin. It was Lenin who proclaimed the right of self determination for the Ukraine when it was a uh, a republic within the uh, USSR, and. Uh, Okay. And uh, evidently, it supported its uh, right to self determination by by splitting. After when did when did it split? I I know I, so little about the uh, history of the Ukraine. I I but don't. I know you Khrushchev, Khrushchev was the one who added parts of Russia onto the Ukraine, like the uh, Donbass region was added onto the Ukraine in 1917 by Khrushchev yeah. by intervention with Lenin, who initially didn't support. The inclusion of the Donbass in Ukraine, and then uh, Crimea was taken over by Khrushchev as well, I believe. Yeah, I am. Um, I am. I am. I am in the process of, tr of trying of, of looking up because it goes back to prehistoric sources, which really are not not relevant. Um, well, it, it, even the, in the nineteenth century. Uh, Ukraine existed, and it saw the presence of the of Russia only involving the, the imperial army and its and its bureaucracy. So Ukraine was separate from Russia uh, during the time of Alexander. It was it was basically after that that uh, that Russia took over Ukraine, and um, and and when it took it took them over. Uh, it turned 42% of Ukrainians into serfs. Wow. And of course, Russia, of course, Russia was what well, Russia was one of the last Western countries, if you want to call it Western, uh, that still practiced feudalism. You can argue yeah. that Afghanistan, Pakistan, or also India even are still to an extent feudal. But uh, but it was it it became feudal as a result of of what Russia did. And so there's a kind of lingering resentment in Ukraine uh, uh, against, uh, against, against Russia for what it did. But, so but in the 19th was, century, Ukraine was independent of the Tsarist Empire? It, it was independent. It, had, it was it only had a, a very uh, minimal Russian presence during the reign of Alexander I, the, the first. Oh, but it was considered to be like part of Russia, even though Ukraine was uh, rather autonomous. It was controlled, though, by Russia because it was turned uh, into a nation of peasants. So they must have had, you know, significant control over the Ukraine at that time. It's it said most of Ukraine fell to the Russian Empire under the reign of Kath Catherine the Great, uh, and the Crimean. Uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce this. K H A N A T E, uh, Hanate, I don't know, was annexed by Russia in 1783, following the emigration of Christians from Crimea in 1778, and in 1793, uh, right bank Ukraine was annexed by Russia 
in the second partition of Poland. So, right. I mean, there's always been some separation between the two. Although uh -huh. Russia has obviously tried to gain control. Dominated, yes. It was a dominion, yeah, like yeah. Canada. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, uh, um, uh, to uh, <clears throat> reiterate, you know, the uh, two references that have picked up on the uh, on the Bundes concept of the no state solution. Uh, let me share a screen here. Maybe I can find the other. <clears throat> it, I think it'll be too complicated. I haven't set it up. Okay, I give up on the initiative. <laughs> I'll just put the addresses for each <clears throat> into the comments the, uh, of the uh, of the video. Click on that green button, share in the middle. Yeah, I know, but I, I don't know where it is, you know, in all my programs, you know, like I have like 10 programs open. <laughs> that, that's, that could be a problem, yes. Yes, get varied by pro programs. And then, then there's this thing called the mobile, which has all these apps. They're not programs. They're completely different, you know, control system, you know, which I have to learn. <laughs> so. And, and Android or iOS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I I use Android apps, but yeah, yeah, apps are kind of watered down programs. Yeah, but the controls are different. You know, like everything's different. You know, <laughs> in them, you know, I have to learn how to operate a completely different uh, digital system. Mm -hmm. But uh, the uh, there's been a, a couple of resignations from the American State Department of uh, of Jewish. I know uh, functionaries, one woman, one man who couldn't stand, you know, to support uh, the Zionist genocide anymore. And so they quit with the support of their colleagues who don't want to quit because they need the job. But the whole State Department seems to be very fed up with Biden. Have you heard about this as well? Oh, yeah, sure. Well, the entire Democratic Party is fed up with him. Uh, the only reason why Biden even has a chance of becoming reelected is because he's running against Trump. Otherwise, he didn't have a chance. If 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 Trump dies and is replaced by some other Republican candidate, that Republican candidate will win. <laughs> uh, anybody, anybody at all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and 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 both of them sadly have uh, have you know early stage or middle stage dementia. Yeah, uh, not something that I like to see because my father had that. He had very, he died with late stage dementia, uh -huh. maybe Alzheimer's, and and they would have. The only way to find that out is with a um, with an autopsy, and autopsies are forbidden in Judaism. And even though my parents were not practicing Jews, they did, did not oh, want to. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh wow, mm -hmm. I didn't know it either until my father died. Mm -hmm. Because I said to my sister, why not have an autopsy? And she said, well, you, you can't in Judaism. Mm -hmm. I was aware of that. That's like the Amish sect as well. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Chassids are like the Amish. So. They, they look like the Amish. So I still find the problem is being, being perpetuated of the, uh, the Jewish organizations that don't realize how Jewish they are. You know, like the Jewish organizations like Jewish Voice for Peace, If Not Now, Not In Our Name, uh, mm -hmm. Independent Jewish Voices in Canada, Independent Jewish Voices in the United States, in England, <clears throat> all these places. These organizations, you know, all they can think about is getting more members, you know, as if that's gonna solve the, the problem of the Zionist uh, dictatorship over the Jewish people. Yeah, they have no philosophy justifying their existence. They just, I mean, they, they have praxis without theory. And <laughs> yeah. Praxis without theory doesn't work very well. Yeah, I mean, they're counting their their organization by the number of members it has, not by the political significance that it carries. And they're big enough, you know, that they could challenge, you know, the Zionist organizations who claim the leadership of the Jewish community. For instance, in the American Jewish Congress, you know, have the uh, Jewish Voice for Peace and the other organizations gone there to to contest the leadership of the American Jewish Congress? Not that I've heard of. You know, what are they letting the Zionists getting away with this for? You know, like they're taking over the whole Jewish community. 
They use the Jewish community as a tax base to supplement the Israel social security system by 35% of donations, you know, in North America go to the Zionist state, you know, to make up for the money that they're stealing from social services to pay for the military. And, uh, and yet, you know, like the, uh, the Jewish anti-Zionist organizations are not saying anything at all about that because it's not the single issue. They're so into single issueism, you know, that they cannot think anymore. And all they can think of, of saying, you know, are a list of slogans that are approved, you know, by consensus, you know, and that's it, you know, like they have no theory, as you say, they have no conception, no conceptual understanding of what their organization is. They have to contest the Zionists for the leadership of the Jewish community, and they have to bring down the Zionist, you know, regime. Because the Zionist state exists not only in Israel, it exists, you know, the right in every Jewish community in North and South America and in Europe. Sadly. Yeah. Sadly. Sadly. I mean, that's, I mean, not, of course, it's not universal, but it's it's almost universal. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean there, you know, there are, at least there are some um, anti Zionist Jews in North America, in, I'm not sure about Mexico, but in, in, yes, in... Mexico. Yeah, um, uh, uh, Abraham Schultz is a member of the Bund, you know, of the Jewish Socialist Bund, and uh, who uh, initiated the uh, the uh, Facebook group called Jewish Not Zionist, mm. and which has seven thousand subscribers. He lives in Mexico City, okay. but he he supports Ukraine. I saw him put a symbol into uh, his Facebook page, having. Uh, a Jewish star with the colors of the Ukraine, you know, embedded into it. So I think he's he must have support, family in the Ukraine or something. That's NATO. That supporting Ukraine is now is supporting NATO, which it shouldn't yeah. be. It shouldn't be. Uh, yeah, Ukraine is a uh, is you know like has has subjugated to itself, you know, to a subordinate position in NATO and working on behalf of NATO is you know and sacrificing all its men. <laughs> Like at the rate of about you know a thousand a day, for the sake of what, of the NATO, and then, and then the Russians, uh, their tanks. I think just three people hit by by a single missile. The whole tank blows up. Everyone is dead. So you, you have people on both sides, most mostly young men, yeah. not exclusively, but mostly young men being being killed, um, and for for, for nothing. Basically, to advance the interests of the American Empire. Yeah, yeah. This was an unnecessary war. I mean, even Putin was was holding back Russian forces from 2014 until 2020 for six years, while the Ukrainian army was invading Donbass, and the local militias were fighting them off, and they managed to keep one third of the Donbass under their control. And now, with the Russian forces coming to help them. They've uh, succeeded in uh, taking control over two thirds of the Donbass, I believe, judging from the military maps. But <clears throat> I don't know what the statistics are on the number of uh, of Ukrainians killed and number of Russians killed, but it doesn't compare to <clears throat> to Gaza. But no, still, you know, I think the Ukrainians have. Have lost well. Actually, it does compare to Gaza. I think the Ukrainians have lost, from what I remember, four hundred thousand soldiers over the course of the years that this war has been going on. Well, the destruction of the uh, infrastructure. Oh yeah. Uh, the destruct. I mean, I mean, they. I mean, wh where is somebody going to live in in Ukraine now? Um, mm -hmm. Same thing is true in Gaza. Yeah. Meanwhile. Uh, uh, you know, the two million Ukrainian refugees who ran away to Europe and North America and were so welcomed include all these men now who refuse to go back, and, you know, because they don't want to go into the military. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like these were the uh, made out to be, you know, Ukrainian heroic refugees when in fact they were draft dodgers, in effect. Hmm. I, I'm not sure. I, I think I might want to dodge the draft if I were in Ukraine, you know. Just yeah. like I, I was planning to uh, move to Canada when the uh, 
during the Vietnam War. Fortunately, uh, Nixon canceled the draft two years before I would have been. Yeah. I, I had a lottery number of three. Oh, a yeah. lottery number of three. I, we three don't know what lottery numbers uh, mean here in Canada. What does that mean? Well, it's three out of 365. So so the lower your lottery number, the quicker you're drafted. Oh, I uh, see. The sooner you're drafted. Okay, so you were about that. to be drafted and sent off draft. for... Immediately. Yeah. How much... They sent off the soldiers, the Americans drafted soldiers to Vietnam. How much training did they get? What what were they trained as? That that that, that I that I don't know. I think basically training in the in the infantry for, for the most part. But um uh I I I've only, I I I've known several people who were um Vietnam veterans and uh they went through basic training. Most of them went into the army, not the. So what is that? Two months, six months, basic training. About two months. Two months. About wow, two months, and you're supposed to be able to save yourself from the strongest military power <laughs> available. Yeah. Wow, the Ukrainian soldiers are sent into battle with like two weeks of training or something like that. Or in some in some cases, no training at all. I mean, pe people just wow. pick up a gun and uh -huh. they. And they, and they just join join a group on, on on the fly and that's it voluntarily they're still doing that yeah wow. yeah who, who was that uh, that 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 um um american uh correspondent or uh terrorism analyst um malcolm forget his last name works for uh, nbc and msnbc he uh temporarily quit his job to uh join a uh Join the, get what it's called, something like the the uh, the National Guard of 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 Ukraine, oh, and uh -huh. was established by Zelensky, uh -huh. and he actually fought. He, he had no training, wow, no training at all. Uh -huh. He stood up there, and they gave him a gun, and he was in the National Guard of Ukraine. Wow, you know, there's a another interesting aspect of the Ukraine that I remember now <clears throat> in my studies, there used to be a, a very large uh, Jewish population in the Ukraine. I mean, Odessa used to be like 35% Jewish. Yes, I know. Yeah. And in uh, 1917, when the revolution was happening, uh, the Communist Party was leading the revolution in Russia, and the Communist Party was leading the Red Army under Trotsky, Ronstein, actually, but there was another army, a revolutionary army in Ukraine that was fighting against the uh, Tsarist monarchists as well. That was a vanguard of the revolution. But because the Communist Party wanted to be the sole vanguard of the revolution, they fought against the Black Army, which was the anarchist army that was fighting for Ukrainian independence. Yeah, Did you know Lev, about this? But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of course, you know, of course, Lev's uh, complicity in in the assassination or the I guess it's called the murder of uh, of so many anarchists, which is why to this day, yeah, reason. Oh anarchists... yeah, they slaughtered each other. The Red Army was slaughtering the Black Army. The Black Army slaughtered the Red Army when they couldn't, you know, encircle them as well. Incredible, yeah. you know, like short sightedness to say the least. And the Red... Black Army, the anarchist army at that time was was led by Machno, and they were called the Machnovici. And they oh. protected the Jewish population. They even granted the Jewish population the Ukraine national cultural autonomy. That's the first place that the Bundes program was actually implemented, besides mm -hmm. Pirobichan, uh, but in Ukraine by the anarchists. And then with the Holocaust, the Ukrainian uh, Nazis uh, did away with the 100,000 Ukrainian Jewish population. And all of that was lost. Yeah. And then the Bundes population, working class of Eastern Europe was lost as well. Yeah, we've suffered too much. And that's why the Bundes is such a uh, a weak position. But theoretically, it's becoming very strong. You know, two other books have come out in 2024 supporting our uh, Jewish Socialist Bund uh, thesis uh, of the book that was published in 1922. <laughs> now, perhaps they're not giving us any acknowledgement, but where else is the idea coming from? <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. So yeah. I guess uh, it's time to conclude. We only have a couple of minutes to go. What would be your uh, conclusion? <laughs> My conclusion? Um, I am uh, I am very concerned, I guess, about the state of the world right now um, with uh, basically with what Netanyahu is doing. Mm. With, uh, his, 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 and unfortunately, the um, the war in Gaza has, or the terrorist campaign in Gaza, as I usually call it, has faded from the news headlines, but it hasn't fa faded from the lives of Gazans. And um, Gazans, for the most part, are, st are still homeless. Mm -hmm. And Netanyahu still, still wants to, if he can, totally wipe out Gaza and, I guess, seize it so he could have access to another seaport. Um, and and so I I mean I mean I despise that man so much. He's such a two faced pig, you know. Like the Americans are saying that it was Netanyahu that's supporting the ceasefire proposal that the Americans are flogging about. You know, like to the Americans, he says he's supporting a ceasefire, and to everybody else, he's saying you know let's continue until a final victory. You know, like what is this a joke? You know, this is not tolerable. And Jewish well, community I, here cannot be uh, allowed to be led around by the nose anymore, you know, like by the Zionist parties. This is unacceptable. Well, a, a lot of it is, is, of course, because Netanyahu does not want those corruption trials to begin, which would uh, like to be convicted. Yeah, even if he's convicted, you know, it's no big deal, you know, like, I don't think he's it, talking about prison time there, you know, like small, small numbers. Well, he doesn't so, want it. And, no, and... yeah, but you know, I think that it's his motivation is you know not so much self-preservation as it is ideological. You know, he wants to be, you know, like these Israeli prime ministers. They each think that they're the you know the savior of the Jewish people, and they want to be recorded in history uh, for for doing the most. You know, to build the uh, the state. You know, the Zionist state. They identify so much with the state. You know that they, you know, they just will destroy everything else, including the Israelis. <laughs> To me, the real danger that Netanyahu poses is, is the fact that, he, of course, he was educated in New England. He um, appears to be American, hmm. talks like an American, more or less. Yeah. And so the person could be easily fooled into thinking that he is one. And so you, uh, the average American listening to Netanyahu may think, oh, I'm listening to an Amer American. Yeah, well, he's going to speak to the Congress again, to the uh, Joint House's uh, presentation yeah. once more, because... Uh, uh, Johnson, uh, a speaker, invited him. Invited him in. You know. Uh, okay. Well, we'll see what he has to say. And the know? duopoly has no objection. That's why there is a duopoly. Uh, yeah. Duopoly supports Netanyahu. There's no objection from either side to Zionism. Both sides are Zionist, and uh, so it's uh, it's inevitable that that's going to happen. But yeah. I mean, I mean. The best thing that could happen for Israel is for Netanyahu to go away. But then, even if he did, who would replace he, him? And and he, but his government is gone. You know, like his government is cracked up. You know, he doesn't have a government. He doesn't have you know a, a governing party coalition anymore. He doesn't even have a cabinet yeah. anymore. He doesn't even have a war cabinet the war anymore. War cabinet has gone away. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he folded it. He folded the war cabinet because there was not yeah. enough people in it. Uh, yeah. But. But but the thing is, even if he goes away, whoever replaces him will be a Zionist too, will be anti-Palestinian. So does it really matter? I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure if it matters. Even oh, that's even... A, a very good concluding point. You know, we might as well finish there. Okay.